Are there no legalities about recording people without their consent? I don't know how the law works in America. In the United States, in 38 states, it's perfectly legal. So, so long as one party is consenting. What does that mean? It means that you know that I'm speaking to you. You are with the person that is recording you. And if you think about it, that makes sense. It's common law um, in America. Um, if you are with a stranger and that stranger records you without you knowing that they're recording your conversation, well, we would believe that the recording device is an extension of the pencil and paper. In fact, in courts, courts have made the argument that society would not consider reasonable an expectation of privacy, which would render a less accurate version of the events in question. Uh, you have more of a right there. Um, Upton Sinclair, who authored The Jungle, ran back to his apartment and wrote down what he saw, but a written rendition of facts is oftentimes not as accurate as a recording of those facts. So as long as one party is consenting, in other words, if you and I are at a bar and I'm talking to you and I'm recording you and you don't know that I'm recording you, it's legal. Now there's 12 states where it's illegal, like for example, California, uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, unless someone nearby can overhear us. We no believe way. That, if someone yeah. nearby is able to overhear you, then Correct. recording is permitted. In California, we often do our journalism in coffee shops. And in, in some states like Massachusetts, the law is so draconian, or Oregon, so you can't even do that. We have challenged the constitutionality of those laws. Again, we believe recording someone that you're with is a, is a constitutional right. And again, it's self-evident. You can write down what they say. <laughs> no one's going to sue you for doing that. So we, we've been very successful in federal court in Massachusetts. We overturned the law. In Massachusetts, uh, Project Veritas did, again, another thing that you did not know that's been edited out of our Wikipedia page, we even overturned the, the law uh, on the grounds it's unconstitutional. Do you think, do you, do you struggle with it ethically beyond the fact that there is a legal precedent for you to be able to record people if there are people around to hear or if one party is the one that understands? Do you feel like capturing somebody's image, their intonation, the way that they're talking about things when their guard is down. Do you ever struggle with that ethically? Um, yes. I mean, this, this book, we, we struggle more with the ethics of what we do than anybody. Of course, the, ra the rub on us is that we're some unethical scumbags who just go around violating people's privacy. But the beauty and bane of ethics is that it's inherently situational, to quote Jessica Midford, who authored a book called The, uh, the, the you know, authored a book on muckraking. Um, and, you know, there's always, journalism is always going to harm people. Information harms people. You know, on, and the, the First Amendment is the first amendment to the Bill of Rights in the Constitution um, because all other rights follow from the First Amendment. So in a, in a society that places a primary value on information that's unauthorized, in other words, I'm publishing information really powerful people don't want published, you're going to harm people. Good journalism harms people, um, but that's the that's the really the what makes us American. I think the the values codified in the Bill of Rights, and uh, in terms of deception, um, on a, a hidden camera is not a form of deception. It's not a form of eavesdropping because the person knows they're being interviewed, and it's not a form of entrapment. You have to go into this realm of undercover work to get to this whole idea of deception. And there's a whole chapter in this book called Deception. I present the paradox of relative deception, which means you have two choices. You can deceive the audience or you can deceive your subject. And you're going to do one of these two things. And I would prefer to deceive my subject such that I can tell the truth to my audience. That because only presumes, you, sorry, James, that only presumes that the subject that you are speaking to would speak untruths if they knew that they were being recorded. There is a situation yeah. in which you could speak to somebody right now. Me and you are having a conversation. I'm not trying right. to deceive anybody, neither are you. So there is a possibility that you can do the recording without deception happening to either party. This is correct. And, and this is what I talked about with Eric Weinstein, but that presupposes that the person is going to be more honest on the record. And I think it's a pretty fair assumption that we are talking about like Pfizer Pharmaceutical and the Department of Justice and the Pentagon – that these people are, yes, I'm a journalist. Please tell me about all the fraud you're committing. I think it's a pretty safe assumption that people in the Pentagon are not going to be honest to a self-identified report of the New York Times. And, and in this chapter called Deception, I, I talk about this. I say, you know, 
you know, that the leak leaks, right? Uh, someone in the New York, uh, New York Times gets leaked documents. Well, oftentimes the leaks, usually it's not in the form of documents, actually. It's in the form of an authorized statement from a two-star general. It's really a form of deception because the person in power is usually manipulating the journalist. And usually those leaks are authorized leaks. The information is is given to the journalist consensually. So we want to do these things non-consensual. We want to do these things without the permission from those in power, which does involve deception towards the source, not the audience. What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.